Today, Teardown receives the second and final part of its campaign, and along with it are some new levels and items. The first half of this video will be light on spoilers, but the second will cover all of the new content. I'll warn you when that's coming. But yes, I was surprised to discover that this would be the final part of the campaign. I don't know why, I just imagined we'd get new missions in bite-sized chunks every couple of months. But instead, here it all is in one go. I'd say it's about the same length as the first part was, making for a decently lengthed campaign. Should you tire of mindless sandbox destruction and want some more focused challenges to figure out instead? I remember reading a lot of comments from people the first time around, expressing disappointment that the timed speedrun style of missions had been chosen to showcase the game and its excellent voxel-based destruction. Those kinds of missions made up the bulk of the first half of the game, but there were also a good number of other one-off and more playful kinds of missions as well, like the one with the lightning strike and the one where you had to destroy that tower, and the one with a helicopter attack and so on. And I think this second part will satisfy most of you by containing even more of these unique kinds of missions, and fewer of the traditional timed speedrun sort. They're still there, but they're now the minority. When the game was first released, everything needs to be unlocked by grinding through the campaign, but it has received a few updates to make the game more accessible. You can give yourself more time, more health and ammo, and you can instantly unlock all of the weapons and maps in the sandbox mode, and can even skip missions in the campaign. Any mission you don't want to play can be skipped, simple as that. You can literally beat the game without playing a single mission if you want to. Which is great news for anybody who might have beaten the game already, but who is now horrified to discover that they have since reformatted without remembering to back up their save files. Everybody's focused on the destruction and physics, but I also appreciate Teardown's many thoughtful little touches like how your home hub developed slightly with every mission, and how all the different missions and characters interacted with each other in ways that you'd appreciate if you bothered to follow the stories in the emails you received. It's all these things that made the campaign such an enjoyable thing to play through, and with this final half I'm happy to say that your guy continues working on his house until it finally becomes a home to be proud of. The campaign definitely takes on a more wintry theme this time around, and many of the levels are coated in snow, or have weather effects of some kind. I know already that some of you are going to make some great memories over Christmas as you play this game. Some of the places you visit are very imaginative and atmospheric, and in the sandbox mode you can freely change the weather and time of day from a number of presets. Don't worry, the new content isn't all snow, but I think that's about all I can say before moving on to the spoilers. Click off now if you don't want to know anything else about it. And don't forget to subscribe. In this second half of the video, I'll conveniently reveal the contents of the second half of Teardown. When the game first came out, I think there were two sandbox levels to play with. This has gradually been increased, and the two new levels in this part brings the grand total up to eight. The first of these two new locations is a tropical island, or several, connected by walkways and arches. I don't know if it's actually bigger than the older levels were, but it feels bigger thanks to its emphasis on verticality, and because of how difficult it is to traverse, with cliffs everywhere. I wish you got a grappling hook to make climbing these cliff faces easier, but sadly this isn't a thing in the vanilla game. What I like to do is to collapse those towers to make bridges across key locations. It's evident that a lot of love and effort has gone into creating this map, and while the cliffs may be indestructible, there are plenty of precariously placed shacks to keep you busy and fans of Crisis will enjoy deforesting the islands. The other new sandbox map is a huge mountain base. I'm actually intimidated by the size of this one. There are countless different floors, and if you fall, it can take some time before you find a way back up again. Like I said, a grappling hook would have been great. This one plays a role in the story, but I don't feel it's so well suited for sandbox destruction. But if you want to roleplay a villain in his secret lair, then this is the place to do it in. I can't get over how beautiful the stock lighting is. This view is spectacular, and I find myself wondering what could be around the next corner. In addition to these two new sandbox maps, the game has also got a number of new items. There are now enough of them that they need to be split into five categories, which I'd describe as harmless, construction, gun, explosion, and enhancement. The first new item is a leaf blower, which blows stuff away. It isn't very powerful and can't be used to fan flames. I think it's probably used to blow debris away when you've done a load of destruction and can't think of a better way of clearing it out of your path. Another new item is the cables, which, like planks, can connect things together in interesting ways, paving the way for rope bridges and other things that I haven't taken the time to experiment with yet. You can also use these to attach stuff to vehicles. Fans of Gmod will think of a thousand uses for these. The hunting rifle is a powerful gun, with a scope that can fire through several layers at once. It is an infinitely powerful mind, it can still take several shots to pass through a large building. 
it's good for triggering explosives from a distance, or for taking out that voxel support from half a map away. Nitroglycerin is a new explosive that sits patiently around waiting for you to shoot it or whatever. It's the most powerful explosive there is, resulting in a sizeable crater that surpasses even what the bomb can create. You can string a load of these together to bring a large building down in a single impressive explosion, or you can use these as makeshift steps and as risky bridges. I haven't paid much attention to these in the short time I've had access to them, but I know they're going to become a sandbox favourite. And finally you get three enhancements. One of them can be strapped to vehicles to boost their speed, another can be used as a short-lived rocket thruster to launch items across the level. I'll warn you now, this sequence made my computer spin up like nothing I've ever heard before. And the third item is an energy drink that gives you greater mobility for a few seconds. But only a few seconds, though I'm sure these will become a speedrunner's favourite tool, and will be used in some incredibly imaginative ways. I don't know what they put in these things, but they're very addictive. And now I'll cover my favourite new missions. I have to start with the robots. I hate them, I'm terrified of them, but they are really cool. They chase you about, and the level that introduces you to them is really well done. I'm not even going to spoil that level for you, you'll get to it soon enough anyway. But I will say, these things have excellent pathfinding, and they happen to be indestructible. I'm not going to lie, these things terrify me as much as that butler from Tomb Raider 2, and I dread it when a level has these things hunting you down. Next I would like to mention this tornado level, where one will spawn in front of you every 10 seconds or so. It certainly makes travelling across the level difficult. I tried transporting an item in a truck and I think it might literally be impossible to do with these things going off around you constantly. Trying to beat this level is frustrating, but it's fun just to mess about with it, and I hope it makes its way to the sandbox mode. The game takes you to an island where you have very limited equipment, which is a staple in games, and it leads to some interesting challenges, like one where you have to destroy a super yacht, which wouldn't be a problem normally, but when you are armed with so little, you've got to get resourceful with your environment, and to search for every supply crate that you can find. There is a hunter helicopter level on the island, at night, which makes for some very tense dashes between huts. I don't feel there's any escape from it on this level, no matter how sneaky you try to be. There's one where you drive a surveillance van and must get a clear line of sight with multiple antennas at the same time, meaning that you go about bashing holes in things and collapsing problem walls in a strategic fashion. Lasers. You must get this laser beam to various points in the level using massive angled mirrors. This is a lot harder than it sounds though, as it never seems to go quite where I want it to. Also, the laser destroys everything it touches. A running theme through a chunk of the campaign is the build-up to Christmas, and there's a mission where you must steal festive stuff from a shop. A shop that's guarded by those big scary robots. Your home gets a lovely Christmassy feel to it, and it's just a shame that when the campaign is done, it's no longer decorated like this. And there's a fairground level where you go about destroying signs. This is a long way through the campaign and I expected it to be harder than it was, but it was instead just a load of fun. I'll leave my improvised playthrough here as I conclude this video. I can't be objective about this game. I do think it's very good, and with this update has finally reached what could be called a finished state. People who beat the campaign and move on will be left satisfied, as will the people who have no interest in the campaign, but who just want to install a load of mods and to destroy stuff in sandbox mode. With this update, both of these halves of the game feel equally complete. Early on there were questions about both, but Teardowns makers have listened to the community and have repeatedly made this game more accessible and more easily moddable. If they stopped work on Teardown right now, no one could complain. There's enough here already to justify its asking price, but I would be surprised if this was the last update it received. The developers do seem passionate about it, and Dennis uses it as his very own sandbox to test new things with. If you've been following him on Twitter these past few years, you'll know that there's a lot more he's toyed with than was made it to this version of Teardown. I have had privileged access to this game. I covered it before release, which was one of the best decisions I ever made, because Dennis must have seen it as he then contacted me to give me early access to it, which was a huge honour. I've seen this game develop and grow, from tech demo into a full game. I've seen it squash the performance bugs and to improve its destruction. And I've tested a number of the community mods for it, which have seriously enhanced the sandbox experience for me. And a few days ago, Dennis contacted me again to give me access to this edition of the game, so I thank him for that as well. I don't feel personally invested in many games, but Teardown is one of the few that I do feel very close to. 